on this week in Enterprise Talk. We talk a little about Google Duplex service and are they still tricking people? Of course, we have the NSA hiding in plain sight. And Brian and I talked with a great guest, Wendy Nather from Duo Security, about zero trust and SSO. Twy on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyte, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 297, recorded June 29th, 2018, Duo Security. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by... LastPass. Secure every password-protected entry point to your business. Join over 33,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely do not want to guide you by myself. I need a little help from my friend, my co-host in crime for today, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Mr. Brian Chi. How are you, my friend? Hey, Lou. I am... Um Sadly, displeased with the latest Skype update. Sorry, chat room. This is the reason why we started just a shade late. Skype decided to do a really big update on the Macintosh version, and we had to go and make all kinds of tweaks to um, our settings to get it so that I don't sound like I'm underwater. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's important is, are you getting some sleep now? I am catching up. Um the Underwater Observatory is playing nicely. And big shout out to the NetBees guys because there is now a NetBees under three miles of water so that I have greater network visibility into my network. Uh, I can actually do iPerf. I can pull SNMP. I can actually integrate my NetBees with uh, Pass Solutions Total View so I can actually see what the heck is going on um, under, under three miles of water. Fantastic. Well, we're going to... We're going to talk a little bit about uh, network visibility a little bit later for sure. But first, you know, we're also going to talk about Google's duplex service and if it, they're making it a little bit less creepy for us, as well as we get to talk about zero trust and SSO with our great guest from Duo Security. But first, we want to bring some of the latest enterprise news to the Arto audience by jumping into the blips. So security through obscurity or basically hiding in plain sight sometimes is the best way to hide. Things slip through the cracks and no one really notices. It's kind of my favorite part of that show, The Americans. There's a normal family by day, but they're spies by night. Well, a shocking report just came out recently based on classified NSA documents, public records, interviews from several AT&T employees that shows that the NSA has been hiding in plain sight. Look, to, look over there. If you could see that tall building, that skyscraper right there. Well, according to the report, the NSA was hiding in it. Just in plain sight in both Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. for actually quite a while. In each of the locations, it was found that the facility contained network equipment from large telecommunication companies that transported large quantities of Internet data around the world. Based on the reports and data, it seems that the NSA has agreements and relationships with numerous phone and Internet providers. The NSA exploits these relationships for surveillance purposes, commandeering massive infrastructure nodes and using it as a platform to covertly tap into communications processed by others. Sounds almost like a conspiracy theory, but one thing it does surface is the concept of zero trust, which we'll get to talk about a little bit later. And if nothing else, follow, follow your gut and encrypt everything. Well, here's an interesting headline. Speedy AI image analysis could help doctors during surgery because it compares 3D scans up to a thousand times faster than before. So let's put this in perspective. The biggest pain of any type of medical imaging is analysis and 3D images multiply that pain factor by many times. 
With the workload of a modern radiologist, it makes sense to apply near real-time AI analysis to do a first cut on the image analysis to help point out tiny details that overworked radiologists could potentially miss. And, you know, the demand for 3D imaging just keeps rising exponentially. The other big issue is that radiologists typically do not have the time to compare what could be hundreds of slices from an MRI or CT scan that may not may have been taken over a period of months or years and be able to spot trends in those images. Especially since the complexity of the scans could involve lots of digging down into in the individual voxel pixels of each image, line them up and then compare them over a series taken by varying skill levels of technicians. Hmm. What AI does is take a lot of the guesswork out of the tedious task of comparing and aligning all those images and then notifying the radiologists of tiny changes in the huge series of 3D images and help identify the slow changes that tumors and such might present in the diagnostic task. So if you've ever learned about the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution as part of the Bill of Rights, you'll know that it prohibits unreasonable search and seizures. The Fourth Amendment requires, as a general rule, that the police officers obtain a warrant based on probable cause before searching a person's house or their papers or their personal effects. So this was the central concern of the framers of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, who well, all well know the danger of the general warrants that allowed government authorities to enter a home and rummage through looking for incriminating evidence. There are a few minute exceptions to the warrant requirement. For example, when police officers lawfully arrest someone, they search, they can search their body in their immediate surroundings and seize any belongings to ensure the officer's safety or the preservation of evidence. But mobile phones aren't weapons and pose no physical threats. That threats, I'm sorry, plus, plus evidence on the phone can be preserved by using special devices to prevent remote deletion of data. Permitting all police officers to search a mobile phone or any digital storage device essentially gives them access to someone's entire life. Allowing them to do so without a warrant renders the Fourth Amendment's guarantee against unreasonable search and seizures meaningless. The Supreme Court wisely rec recognized that, the, that that to be the truth and held the government must obtain judicial permissions before searching mobile phones. But this doesn't actually cover location data or cell phone tracking data. This type of data can be used to pinpoint your historical data or whereabouts, your whereabouts at any point in time, including locations that other criminals have been. Well, the Supreme Court handed down a landmark decision recently, Carpenter versus the United States, ruling four to five that the Fourth Amendment protects cell phone location information as well. I don't know about you, but I consider a victory and justice for all. Well, we are network geeks, and one of the hot topics is software-defined networks. Find out that software-defined networks are actually, as far as security goes, a double-edged sword. The benefits of software-defined networks are the proverbial double-edged sword for network administrators and hackers alike. The ability to quickly change how networks act also means that if a packer penetrates the SDN control system, this also means they can tap or redirect network connections through the SDN cloud for nefarious reasons. So what this article points out is that our industry must design in security as part of the SDN fabric and not take the knee-jerk reaction of just duplicating our existing networks. Some pros and cons, well, SDN provides all the benefits of virtualization, generally such as agility, cost-effective redundancy, and scalability. With SDN security, uh, SDN security becomes scalable. It no longer requires a bunch of hardware and proprietary security controls to deploy, and security can scale as software scales and as new clouds and workloads and network segments are provisioned. Example, here is how VMware's NSX data center provides very straightforward ways to segment and firewall virtual machines, which simplifies security. It provides the flexibility to shut down misbehaving segments. The network-wide visibility makes it possible to identify malicious actions and take the appropriate steps, such as quarantines. If a worm or malware enters and starts diddling with the configuration, that can then be locked down or blocked. So, sorry, the bottom line is, You've got some design flexibility 
it's up to you to design security into your SDN and get your security team involved in the design to make that flexibility work in your favor instead of against you. Do you have a Chromebook? Well, get ready. Your app support will soon be expanded to be able to run Linux apps as well. Dubbed Project Christini, it allows Linux applications to run on Chrome OS. Over the past months, this project's been maturing actually quite fast based on the latest commits to the Canary and developer channel repos of the OS. For normal users, they'll have to wait for general availability of the Chrome OS base books in version 69, but it seems that the support is coming to most Apollo Lake-based Chromebooks. Based on the string of commits, the code repositories, it seems that the support isn't simply being turned on, but it does show that all the cumbersome steps of interacting with the terminal, checking dependencies and authentication will be hidden away for the user. And it also shows that the user interface hasn't been solved just yet, but it does provide hints on the experience. How will the apps be deployed? Well, it seems that the standard DEB file container could just be double clicked and the app would be sideloaded. This feature will no doubt simplify setup and installation for inexperienced users and make interacting with Linux apps less daunting for those who are not familiar with Linux. This could also cause an interesting market shift as well because more and more schools and organizations are actually upgrading or going to cheaper Chromebooks. The question remains if this will also cause less trust for the devices since the OS is now allowing for more executables to run on the device that could have more access to the underlying resources of the OS. If you're interested, check out the list of the supported devices and get that latest Canary build. I have a feeling we'll hear more and more communications from Google on this project as the September market rolls along. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's LastPass. I'll tell you right now, LastPass is one of my favorite tools. I use LastPass every day. It's one of my favorite tools. Think about it. You have a username and password for every website that you go to that needs to be secured, whether it's your bank or for me, it's actually five different banks. You gotta, you're just actually supposed to have different username and passwords for every site. It becomes almost impossible to remember and manage. And if you don't want to write that password down on sticky notes, or you don't want to, because you don't want to lose that. You don't want to put it in a plain text on your computer or even your email because that's not secured. Well, that's where LastPass comes in and saves us all. LastPass automatically remembers and fills in your passwords anytime, anywhere, wherever you are, whatever computer or mobile device. All you have to do is remember that master password and LastPass remembers the rest. I remember I got hooked on LastPass on my desktop, but now I use it on all my devices, including my mobile phone. They have browser add-ins to make it easier for you to web log in, supporting browsers both Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and more. Plus, it works great on Android and iOS. I actually remember the day that I was at work and my family needed a password for the bank account to basically pay a, make a payment. But did I remember that password? Absolutely not. All I had to do is visit LastPass Vault, use one of my my one and only master password, and bam, I can give them that password. LastPass literally saved me time, and time is money. Now, I'm talking about my personal use of LastPass, but they also have LastPass families for the entire family, and LastPass also works for enterprise too. Enterprises are always battling people trying to breach their networks. Over 81% of breaches are caused by weak or reuse passwords. LastPass makes it easy to use unique random passwords that your employees don't have to remember or even write down because that's not secure. Plus, password sharing is really hard. LastPass makes it easy for your organization to actually share those passwords easier and more secure. Organizations can set master password requirements, restrict access to specific devices and locations, enable password resets, and a ton more features. And you can configure over 100 policies access security reports, and create shared folders. You can share a ton of stuff, including organization database logins, SSH keys, support software licenses, and other important business information. Data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level. So data is stored in the vault. It's kept secret, even from LastPass. You and your employees can take up the LastPass security challenge as well. It'll, let you, it'll tell you how secure your passwords are and show your areas for improvement. I am a LastPass user for life. It's a great tool. At work and at home, fix your password woes with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash twit and see which product is right for you. 
And we thank LastPass for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we'll soon get to my favorite part of the show, which is bringing in a guest for the Twilight Riot. But first, we want to jump into the bites. And this one's interesting. We, we talked about Google Duplex in the past, and it's freakishly human AI assistant, which had actually stirred the market back in May, where the company actually tricked a bunch of employees and organizations around appointments and reservations. So this created a quite a bit of a snowball effect in the market and debates on ethics and on whether Google is trying to trick people, uh, and uh, which is essentially is approaching the dark areas of AI. So some of the questions that were out there around ethics, what are the ethics of making people think that they're talking for to a real person? Do services like Duplex need permission from the person on the other end before recording the call? And just how high of a tolerance do people have to have for something they could use, be used for creepy, even criminal pursuits in different hands? Well, Google's trying to address these problems. Duplex is now called an automated booking service. It's not called Duplex anymore. And it's also honoring states' laws around recording. Plus, if businesses are uncomfortable with the concept, they can actually opt out from receiving Duplex calls. Scott Huffman, the VP of Engineering of Google Assistant, also admitted that the demo given at Google I.O. was a bit too polished, and they decided to instead target real-world scenarios like interacting restaurants with restaurants and hair salons. Even though the caller is informed this is an automated assistant. It still stir, still actually peppers in different conversation and verbal ticks to help conversations move along um, like naturally, just like oh or um or sure. If a conversation goes off the rails, again, a human operator at Google's call centers can take over. During their recent demo, the du duplex actually called up a local business was starting with, hi, I'm Google's automated service booking service. So I'll re record the call. Um, can I book that table for Saturday? So at a point, they were also able to say, hey, I think I got confused. Hold on, let me get an operator. And four out of the five calls stayed fully automated and only one had to be turned over to humans. Okay, Chibert, I want to I want to I want to get your thoughts on this because we, we talked about, you know, this Google duplex service in the past. But, you know, it really kind of brings in, you know, is Google making the right changes here? Are they is it something they need to did, did they need to do more here? Or is it, they've done enough? For sure, dude. I'm a Google Duplex automated attendant. <laughs> anyway, yeah, they're doing. They're going in the right direction. We all want Jarvis, you know. Ever since we heard uh, Mr. Bettany talking, you know, doing doing the role of Jarvis on Iron Man, everybody says we want it. Well, we need to kind of weigh the odds. You know, are do we want it? Do we not want it? So some of the things we need to keep in mind is. Um, you mentioned the recording. Google, in order to ana analyze this, they're recording your voice. And then it goes to a back-end system and says, hey, um, you know, we, we got to now analyze it. But te technically, conversations can only be recorded legally in some states if both parties agree. So that's why they're, say they're starting off the conversation with that. There are a lot of states, Hawaii's included, where it's only a single party. Only one side has to agree to the recording. So this is going to be a real interesting. I am actually kind of waiting for the ACLU to jump in, uh, which is going to make Google's life really difficult, and it's going to slow down the path to Jarvis. But the reality is, is with, you know, we're going to have to, balance a lot of this stuff. Google's uh, duplex, now the automated attendant system, could potentially save businesses a lot of money. And having the, um, you, know, ha ha you know, having that ability to drop it in so that you don't have to pay a, a receptionist, or better yet, say it's a lar fairly large organization and you don't have to pay a bank of receptionists. So maybe you have just two or three or whatever to handle a large number of calls and only the calls that really go off the rail or if the AI assistant weird someone else out. So <laughs> I think there's I think there's going to be a lot of things. You know, I think it's really going to help places. I think it's going to help education a lot. Obviously, I've got a big education bent, but I don't know. I don't hardly know of any university that still has um, a full-time set of operators. 
and having a AI to be able to go and help redirect things uh, could actually be a very big health and safety issue in the long run. So I say, yeah, let's let's move forward. Let's be careful, but let's move forward. Right. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think there are organizations starting out there that need this kind of system to kind of assist them, um, you know, because, you know, paying customer service agents, training them to be, you know, human and down to earth and, you know, forthcoming, it's it's tough to do. So I think providing systems like this could be interesting to help start that. But the question also relies, like, you know, will this, this system learn? So will it start to kind of grow and expand itself so it learns more about colloquialisms and idioms and all of this types of things so that this way it can sound even more human and get more kind of ingrained? So then you really don't know at this point. Now, I, again, they have this moniker in the beginning where they say, hey, like this is a Google assistant. We're, we're not a real person, you know, but in the same sense, you know, I can't imagine that this is going to be the only application for this. I mean, obviously, they're saying they're only targeting restaurants and reservations and, and things like appointments for hair salons and stuff. But I can't imagine that being the only application here. Like, I think, you know, we can think of like customer service type organizations where, you know, you call in and you want to feel like you're talking to somebody real rather than getting that automated like voice um, menu system. Plus, you know, when you get into actual customer service issues, like again, small organizations, they can't pay big companies to do sometimes, uh, you know, their own people, let alone like big companies do customer service. So this might also help them as there as well. I mean, what do you think, Chibert? Is this is this something that we're going to see? Even though Google kind of freaked people out in the beginning here, you think we're going to they're going to start applying it to different parts of the market, like you said, even in the EDU? Yeah, I think we're going to start saying, I, I think people are, I think Google needs to obviously hit the low-hanging fruit. But I think one of the low-hanging fruits that they also need to hit is automated attendance on telephone systems. That is, you know, a large, large cost item for a lot of corporations, insurance, um, banking, education, you name it. People that want to have information. The web is not the do-all, end-all for a lot a lot of the older generation, but you have to balance privacy and customer service. And it, I think as long as you're upfront about it and provide a way to opt out, I think Google will avoid having the ACL sharpen their knives in their direction. So I think, yes, I can't wait. I would love to get my hands on the API because there's a few things that I would love to be able to use it for, for science. You know, people want to know wh where what's happening with the Vogue plume from Kilauea. Um, and there are some people that only deal with telephones. And our departments keep getting these phone calls. I'd love to be able to automate things like that. And I'm sure the National Weather Service would love to automate some things. So I think such an API that will work instead of the really clumsy things that we started playing with, you know, a few years ago, having something as intelligent and as smooth as Google AI could go a long way towards solving a lot of problems, especially for people that are handicapped or, you know, something like that. So we have we have seen like I think in China there was the uh, AI that actually did the newscast. Like, do you think that, you know, we should be worried about you know, this type of technology actually taking away jobs now that maybe it could get better at learning things and dealing with things. Um, obviously, people do some specific jobs, like you were saying, customer service, answering questions. You know, this could take away from jobs, right? Yeah, but then again, you know, there are some, you know, there's some things that humans still do better. Um, but I look at it as, okay, a balance, there's going to be some jobs where I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're going to have to retrain. You're going to have to think of other things. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a balancing act. As far as, you know, that newscaster, look at it a slightly different way. Wouldn't it be great to be able to have, um, say, once an hour, once every half hour, once every 15 minute news updates? Um, all through the night, no matter what time zone you're in. Wouldn't that be cool? And Absolutely. I'm sorry, newscasters aren't cheap. Programmers aren't cheap. Um, yeah, ZipDog, yeah, he's on the phone. So 
life is good. Uh, <laughs> there are many, there are many things, and I don't know about you, but when I first saw Jar, you know, Iron Man talking to Jarvis, Tony Stark, I wanted one. I really yeah. do. I, Me too. I now have six Amazon Echoes <laughs> because <laughs> You're I surrounded. really like. Yeah, I actually have one in my car. And it actually made my longer drives much, much safer because I'm not fussing around changing my music or playlist. I, I can tell the Amazon Echo that I want to shift to Audible and play a book. I think Audible is a sponsor for Twit still. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I love it. I, I love being able to shift things around. I love being able to ask questions of it while I'm driving. I love to be able to be half awake in the morning, just barely, and I hear something happening at the front door, and I can ask my Amazon Echo to display the front door cam for my Ring doorbell, which is also a Twit sponsor, sorry. <laughs> Lots of sponsor examples. But yeah, having an AI, even something as simple as the Amazon Echo, has changed my life. I'm really looking forward to seeing how the Google AI can really change other services that, you know, might make the drive in safer, might make it easier for someone that might have, say, cerebral palsy. You know, there's a lot of things that can, it can do really, really well. And I think we just have to make sure we manage the balance between good right. and bad and be right. upfront about the use of the AI. Absolutely. Yeah, I think even Specs in the chat room says, hey, I'd love this for my for my own phone system. I would love it too. Like being able to have somebody call me, I don't know the number, hey, let the system pick up, let it sound like a normal human being, make it act like it's me and get the message, get the information and then let me know how, give me some kind of rating as, hey, this was this a cold call? Was it a sales call? Was it a real thing? Was it a, you know, let me know. Give me some more information rather than just the transcript. That should be, that would be interesting too. I think there's going to be some really good applications here. All right, well, let's jump to the network. next one. I think the next one's pretty interesting as well. It's, it's, around, it's around jobs. It's around kind of talent in the kind of the open source side of things. You know, we're starting to see trends. In fact, Google, uh, Google uh, I'm sorry, GitHub project trends last month. There's been a ton of open source kind of moving forward. We're still considering to see lots and more kind of open source move to the industry. We're seeing things like more web development libraries like Vue.js, React, and others, as well as cross-platform development like Google's Flutter, Vue Native. But then you're seeing more machine learning repos as well for platforms like TensorFlow. And what you'll see actually is there are some GitHub trends that they actually picked up. And that's actually, you're seeing more cross-platform development like Electron Apps, React Native. But you're also seeing more deep learning, which is TensorFlow, Keras, Mozilla's deep speech and containerization like Docker and Kubernetes. What the interesting thing here, though, is we're starting to see an uptick in Linux talent as well. And that's a, that's actually a hard part because a lot of people in the industry, it's hard to find open source talent and people who know Linux. In fact, employers are looking for a ton of expertise. Um, and that includes, in fact, Linux looking for 80 percent of the jobs right now. There's there's actually calling out Linux. Containers expertise, actually 20, 27%, all the way up to 57% this year. Security, as well as web tech, down, up, from, up from 49%. Networking is actually up from 46%. And 34% are looking for open source knowledge of licenses and compliances. This is interesting because, you know, Chibri, I want to throw it over to you. I think this, this shows that you know, there's this new mindset, you know, open sharing mindset of, hey, we need a ton of coders, but we need them in more open source technology. We, want, we don't want these proprietary technologies that are owned by big business anymore, but we want things that are open source so they can make them, improve them and make them better and help them scale for their business. Are you seeing this in the ED, is in the education side of things as well? Actually, the education side led the wave. Um Truth be told, with the higher cost of everything, <clears throat> you know, apologies to the Microsoft licensing people, but when you get licenses that require us as in the education market, where our licensing cost is counted by FTEs, not by users, not by simultaneous users, but by FTEs. So to get a full 
um, license for, say, Microsoft Education, we would have to license it for the entire University of Hawaii student population, which is in excess of 50,000 students just for day, plus in excess of 5,000 uh, employees. That is an awful lot of full-time employment, CR1. FTE is how you indicate how many full-time employees you have. Um, <clears throat> that has driven many, 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 many universities to just go as much open source or Linux as possible because of cost. And then the higher education folks, the computer science, engineering, so forth, there has been a richness in open source because of cost. I'm sorry, the, the, the cost of this, the cost of the tools has been high enough that education has done the knee-jerk reaction, went to open source, discovered they like it, and now the vast majority of the larger open source projects have at least, if they're not centered around, they are associated with a lot of universities because that's where the talent's coming from. A lot of people right. say, you know, why did Silicon Valley get so, you know, get grow so much? And it's because the talent was coming out of the universities. So, you know, my last bit on the soapbox is I founded my lab specifically to try and train up high end network engineers with the specific reason that I, I saw the need to drive the cost of networking engineers down. And you don't do that by making it a rare skill. You make it a surplus skill. The cost drives down, but hopefully the quality goes up. So I'm trying to graduate students that have these skills, try and fill in that 40%, um, 46% rating for networking, and try and make high-end network specialists more available. I think that is what's really and truly driving open source is driving getting people able to have the experience without having to spend a lot of money because students never have a lot of money. And that, I think, is the number one reason why open source has been this wave that, or let's call it even a tsunami, that a lot of companies really haven't seen because they haven't been that involved in education. Right. How's that for a soapbox? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's interesting because, in fact, it's definitely a learning tool. Like, I think, you know, for me, I learned about OAuth and some of the other kind of security uh, sides of software um, just by looking at open source libraries in GitHub and in GitLab. And I think that it's really been helpful for me, especially from an education standpoint. And then also, you know, a lot of businesses, they especially, you know, small or large businesses, they benefit from open source because you're looking at, you're thinking about, okay, like, hey, you know, I can go out and see what the industry is using here, what people are focusing on and improving on. Plus, you tend to get the latest and greatest. People are improving the systems. You know, they're they're offering up their time. They're fixing bugs. They're making it more performant. Um, you know, and that's so much like as as well. But you know, think about it from this. Like we do see. I think it was Airbnb just recently put out an article about they're using open source React Native, which is a technology done by Facebook which allows you to build kind of a cross-platform development experience where you can build, you write your code in JavaScript and you get kind of like a native UI around it. And the key here is they tried to move some of their applications over to it, but they found some issues with integrating it into their system. And so now they're looking to go more proprietary. But you see a lot of people that are also succeeding in doing open source as well. So you see a lot of organizations, like look at TensorFlow. It's a huge, huge thing that's going on out there right now uh, around... Um, around AI, I'm sorry, machine learning. I mean, that's a huge thing that's going on right now. So I, I definitely see the advantage here and the the push. Now, we, we also heard about the Linux side of things too. Like for instance, Microsoft's pushing Linux quite hard uh, with uh, I think their IoT end devices, which is the Azure Sphere OS that they're putting on their devices. I mean, Cheaper, do you see this a lot more is even just the push for Linux? Because we're seeing Google Chrome OS now going, hey, let's, let's allow uh, Linux apps to run. We're seeing big organizations say, hey, well, one Linux on our devices, our IoT devices, and so on. Is this just the next push for Linux? Is it, Will it bring it back to even more uh, fame? Yeah, actually, embedded Linux is driving an awful lot of things that are happening in the open source world. Now, since Kurt's not here, I want to talk about the flip side of the coin. The bigger frustration that I've seen with open source is the vast majority of 
I don't like how you did it, so I'm going to do a different distro. Having all these different distros, just like Keith 512 and Cursed One have been talking about, <clears throat> it hasn't been that great. You know, I, I've got to choose between Ubuntu, CentOS, and so forth. <clears throat> now, what has been happening, so let's let's bring it back, is people like Microsoft and Google and even Facebook, to an extent, have been going in and saying, hey, Linux and open source needs to grow up. Uh, Cursed One had a very, very good point. The lack of documentation. Too many developers go and say, well, we just threw our documentation in GitHub. Yeah, as if my grandma is going to go to GitHub to learn how to use the system. Ain't happening. But having large corporations like Microsoft and Google and Facebook really pushing and using open source and supporting open source we might start, I'm hoping we see the industry grow up and see the quality of the documentation improve, the quality of the user interfaces improving, and so forth. The reality is, is too many open source projects, the developers aren't even using a freaking spell checker. Come on. And that's one of the th reasons why open source has had a tough time in the corporate world. How's that for talking about the flip side? Fantastic. Did great. <laughs> well, I want to end with that because I think I think that open source is one of those things. It's a it's a great topic to bring in, and we could definitely talk about it a lot more. So I'm sure we'll have some more uh, guests on and some more topics about it in the future. But we we definitely I want to get to my favorite part of the show because we have a great guest today, and and this allows them to kind of jump in and bring some knowledge to the Twilight Ride. And today, it's some really great knowledge about security and how I move to your organization to have better security. Today's guest is the director at, of advisory of CISOs of of Duo Security. My name is Wendy Nather. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Thank you for having me. It's fantastic to be here. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here. We're, we're excited about the topics. Um, maybe we should just start with giving us a little bit of uh, history of you, how you kind of, your kind of journey through the industry. Uh, well, I started out life as a poor Unix admin and uh, then worked my way into security later on, uh, working for a Swiss bank, and then also working in security in the public sector for state government. So uh, ha having found my way to Duo, I, I like to think that I've married all of those experiences together to be able to help make something that all kinds of enterprises can use. Right. Well, even though Duo is a, a sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech and Twit Network, we, we have some amazing topics today to just go over in general about, you know, kind of security, how you make your organization more secure, um, you know, kind of the zero trust security model. So wh why don't we get into the nitty gritty of this? What, you know, maybe I'll start with my ignorance side of things of saying, hey, you know, wh what type of attacks, Wendy, are there out there today? Like, what, what am I what do I have to worry about? Well, we could just spend the whole time discussing all the different kinds of attacks. Are, are you asking about the kinds of attacks that sort of prompted the zero trust movement? Yeah, I would say like any type of attacks. When, you know, when 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 organizations worry about them today, what are they normally worrying about? Uh, well, what they're really worrying about is, uh, let's just say that we figured out a long time ago uh, in a network far, far away that <laughs> it was not a good idea to trust um, users coming in um, just because they were on the inside of the firewall. And we've known this for decades. We've known this for a really long time, but couldn't figure out really what to do about it. And so um, groups like the Jericho Forum in the UK around 2003 started talking about something called deperimeterization. What if we pretended there was no firewall? How would that cause us to treat the users and their devices and the applications that they were accessing uh, if we just acted like we didn't have a firewall. So that's really where things started. And then John Kindervog in around 2008 or 2009 coined the phrase zero trust to sort of say, well, you should not be trusting anything uh, without verifying it first. Right. And so you, know, you kind of brought up a little bit of zero trust. So like, what's on the you, you talked a little bit about how hey, endpoint security, we're worried about firewalls, we're putting those in, we're trying to block. 
But the zero trust model kind of goes to the other side. It says, like you said, no, don't trust anybody. Make it look like your external network is your internal network and kind of go through that route. What are what are some of the principles that zero trust trust kind of pushes on? Like it's a, it's called a security model. So what what try to type of principles does that kind of model follow? Well, the thing it's trying to protect against really is uh, attacks like if you remember Aurora uh, that. Um, where nation state attackers got into Google's networks as well as other large companies. Um, the reason why they were able to get where they could was because once they were inside the network, they became trusted automatically and they could pivot and uh, move laterally and go just about anywhere. So the whole idea of zero trust, not trusting anything just because it's inside the network was intended to address that. But you have to ask yourself, the the principles are fine. If we are not trusting something because of the network it's on, then what else do we need to do to verify it? So some of the things that you can do are doing additional authentication of the user, like with multi-factor authentication. Then you also want to look at the device that they have and you want to see whether it is meeting um, your level of security hygiene, whether it is at risk of being compromised, which is another thing that you care about. And um, you put those together with the fact that we used to stay put when we were using applications, but now users are mobile, they're everywhere, and the applications are everywhere. They're not just in the data center. Uh, SaaS applications are external. So you want to have a model where you can validate the user, the device, and the application regardless of where any of those are. Right. Now, an interesting thing is like, you know, a lot of the, I see a lot of reports out there, hey, if you want to start doing zero trust manually, which is not always easy, you need to start doing things like don't deploy services unless they're authenticated. Like stop deploying unauthenticated services. Start collecting more data. So start actually in running and understanding the data about your users, what they're doing, what data, what devices are accessing, how the, what's data flowing through their devices, that kind of thing. Starting to understand that. Also, um, understanding, configuring host-based firewalls, hot firewalls around your or your data and your resources, making sure you understand how they're secured and so on. Are these some of the things that you would kind of recommend to people that are kind of trying to go into zero trust? Trust. Uh, I would, uh, although I do have to say that the phrase zero trust itself can be problematic because when John Kindervog coined it, he meant to say that you should not grant access to anything without having verified it first. And for him, that's what the word trust means. It means blindly granting access. Now, if you don't define it that way, if you think of uh, granting access as trusting something because you verified it, uh, then your definition of trust is a little bit different. And um, I would not say to enterprises that they can never trust anything because let's face it, users get pretty cranky when you keep wanting them to authenticate over and over and over again. So you have to trust for some length of time, for some purposes. You want to say, okay, we're going to remember your device um, for the length of the session or we're going to remember it for a week. Um you know, the, the session for this application is going to be two hours or, it, you know, it's going to be longer than that. And a lot of this is balancing usability with uh, and the user experience with what you want to test. Right. So thinking about trust and deciding that it's it's neither binary nor permanent. You're never going to trust something or a user to do anything and you're never going to trust them forever, which is what we used to do with firewalls. Um, just saying that it's going to be for specific things and it's going to be for a specific amount of time, then that's where enterprises should be focusing their effort on on implementing this. Right. So, you know, we, we t you talked a little bit about Google and their attack, um, their Aurora, their Aurora attacks around their Google Gmail and so on. You know, after that, it seems like they learned their lesson. They went into this kind of campaign mode of creating Beyond Corp. What, what was kind of Google's methods of securing more things and kind of getting into that zero trust model? What, what kinds of things that they started doing? Well, they wrote some really great uh, white papers. I think there are a total of five or six now. Um, and they described a, a number of things. One of them is centralized access proxying. So um, no matter where you, the user is coming from, they have to go through this access proxy to get uh, where they're going. Another thing that they did was to 
uh, create different tiers of sensitivity and security requirements based on the sensitivity of the data that the applications are protecting. So, for example, if you're looking at a, a, an employee cafe menu, you know, you, you don't really care as much about who's asks, accessing it and why. Uh, but if it's uh, an admin trying to get into your ERP system, you care a whole lot and you're going to set very high levels of security that they have to meet. Um, so diff doing different levels of security with a centralized access proxy, authenticating the users, and also making decisions on the fly with every authentication as to what they can access based on what you know about their device state. And Google has a lot of information about the state of the device. Um, it, historically, what it had been doing, what its components are today, and deciding whether it can trust that device here and now. And so putting all those together with a lot of other information is how they implemented it. Right. I, I think, you know, this whole concept that you hear a lot in the market about is assume breach. Assume that assume that your network is breached. Act like you're just the public Internet. Figure out ways to better secure your network. Figure out better policies, better ways to monitor that kind of thing. So it sounds like it's Google's model. They've been able to do that. But it sounds like it's complex to implement. So it, it sounds like they're, they've done a bunch of work obviously internally to figure this out. They've published white papers saying, hey, you can go do this, but it doesn't sound easy. So what, what kinds of things um, is Duo Security doing to make this easier? Well, we're all about making it a lot easier. And ideally, you wouldn't even need to know a lot about security to be able to implement this. Uh, so what we have designed is, is a, a suite of functionality together on a platform so that you can do a lot of this just with uh, with the Duo editions, with our MFA, with our Access edition, which gives you visibility into devices, and then with our Beyond edition, which lets you mark devices as trusted, either because they're corporate owned and you manage them, or just because you've seen them before and you expect to see them again, as with employee owned uh, BYOD devices. So we've put all that together, but it's important to to realize that this whole, um, I, I hate saying paradigm, but I'm going to say paradigm um, <laughs> uh, of zero trust is that it is not a, any given technology and it's not any given product. You can put it together in a lot of ways. So yes, it took Google about seven years to build it themselves. We've put it together so that a company can get this pretty easily out of the box, but our functionality also works with whatever you already have. So for example, if you already have um, a, a proxy of your own, uh, for example, if you're using Akamai's EAM, uh, we integrate with that. We will integrate with your identity providers. Um, so there are a lot of ways to get to this, but if you you know just want the very easy button, we've tried to create that. So Wendy, I'm, I, I need to have a disclaimer. The University of Hawaii is a duo customer. And oh, no. So, <laughs> so this actually comes from both me and my campus IT group. We are dying for U2F or MFA dongles to be available across browsers. Right now, I have a bunch that will work with Chrome, but nothing else. I have some that will work with Safari, but nothing else. With well, your what view kind of dongles are you talking about? Uh, I'm using God. What, what's that company called? We we actually interviewed them. <laughs> I have I'm having a. Oh, that's I'm okay. We, we we can talk later. But uh, I mean, one thing we do do is we integrate with YubiKey. Um, yeah, those are the guys. And that will work. Up, uh, okay. Yeah. And. Uh, but uh, if you're saying that you're having trouble getting it to work. With other, with other browsers, and uh, you know, I think we have to take a look at that. Yeah, the um, there has been confusion. I've tried to implement a few things, and it doesn't play nice. And my IT group has had a few challenges. So may, maybe we should take a conversation offline. But I know um, the chat room and our live audience would love to know where do you think the industry is going with some standardization in the U2F market? Oh, that's a good question. This is where I have to, to put up my sign. 
I'm pretty sure I have no idea. Um, <laughs> n- no, actually, um, we are working with a lot of groups um, to work on standardization because that is very important to smooth out that um, to, to smooth out that interaction for users, as you were mentioning, across browsers and across applications and across um, across devices and everything else that you could possibly use, we're never going to get there without standardization. So we're pretty active in the web uh group, and uh, we're also very active with the FIDO Alliance, and uh, we are, you know, integrating with everything that we can find out there. So I agree that standardization is the way to go, um, so that everyone can use this with the same sort of experience, and that it, it works smoothly. So, so Wendy, I did want to ask, like a lot of software systems out there today, they all kind of diff- use different ways of single sign-on, and you know, sometimes, sometimes they're they implement things that are, you know kind of backwards and they don't always work. You know, there's lots of CRM systems out there like HubSpot, Sugar CRM, and Salesforce, Dynamic CRM, all these different ones that use potential different SSO mechanisms, um, you know, two factors kind of integrated with that. You know, what types of things, I, it sounds like, do a way of doing things is you you created kind of like a, a direct proxy endpoint that everyone kind of goes through and then dual kind of handles the rest here. So does that mean that it could pretty much handle any application in your system that you throw at, especially from an SSO standpoint? Uh, from an SSO standpoint, we do offer that functionality. Uh, again, we can also work with other SSO applications depending on what you already have in place. Um, but yes, that's part of the experience is connecting that. So handling everything after the primary credentials, everything after the login and password, passing that over to Duo, and then having us look at everything else, looking at the state of the device without an agent. Um, you know, just telling you what you need to know about what's what's being used and letting you make policy decisions. Um, mm-hmm. th- the way we're really working is as, you know, the, the policy enforcer for everything else that you want to decide about granting somebody access after they've successfully put in their username and password. Right. So another interesting thing you kind of mentioned is, um, you know, the principles behind zero trust is the fact that once you actually trust the device, you can kind of give them and grant them access. Um, so that's interesting. What are what are some of the customers doing? I think, you know, it sounds like the service, these most these services kind of begin once you say, hey, I trust this device, you deploy something to it to say, hey, this is a trusted device. Now it's on the network. But what are some organizations doing to say, hey, like I need to apply some some rules, try, try to scan the device or whatever, figure out what's going on with it, see if I actually should trust it. And then I kind of apply that policy to it. What are some companies doing for that? Well, at the at the simplest level, what a lot of our customers are doing are simply I, being able to distinguish corporate-owned devices from non-corporate-owned devices. So, for example, we had one customer who thought they had about 800 devices in their asset inventory. And then when they... In, implemented Duo and looked at what devices were really authenticating to their applications, they found an additional 2,200 devices that they had never heard of before that were also being used. So just being able to make that distinction between what you think is accessing your applications and what you know (laughs) is accessing your applications can be a great start. From there, uh, if you don't want to restrict access just to corporate owned uh, assets, for example, if you have third parties that are, are bringing in devices and you're not allowed to manage them, but you have to let them access things, um, you can set a bar for security. So you can say, for example, you have to have lock screen enabled, you have to have your software up to date, you have to have the disk encrypted, it can't be jailbroken, uh, those sorts of things. And you can set the bar so that even if you cannot manage that device, you can uh, you can enforce what state it needs to be in in order to access your your application. So this kind of changes the dynamic between 
uh, users and their devices and the enterprise to more of a collaborative environment. It used to be that you were issued something, they managed it for you, you had no choice in, in what happened to it. But now, you know, with the consumerization of IT, that's not practical anymore. So that's what Duo has made possible is for you to set these levels of, of expectation for security um, in a more collaborative way with your users. So one interesting thing is, you know, I kind of I tend this to send this out to multiple people. The same question is around the scenario is, like, let's say someone does get my device. They somehow crack it open and and, and that device was trusted um, on to be on the network at some point. You know, are there things like, for instance, I try to access a very sensitive piece of data thereafter because I stole this device. Are there things to essentially alert to say, hey, like this person's acts might normally have access to this piece of data, but they're not they're in a different location. They're in a strange location that we've never seen before. Um, is there ways to kind of revoke access Is there ways to detect that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for example, it makes it easier even if somebody has just terminated employment someplace and you haven't gotten around to disabling their password, um, you know, you can disable them at the centralized proxy point so that they can't authenticate even if, you know, their, their password is still working. Um, but for uh, as for everything else, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can determine what's going on with the device and how long you want to trust it for. For example, we can work with um, endpoint security products uh, so that based on uh, whether you're managing something with MDM or whether you have something like Tanium uh, on the endpoint, depending on what uh, information you're getting from those, you can decide to grant or, or disallow access. Um, we just announced recently um, user and entity behavioral in analytics um, in beta for Duo so that uh, we can alert on things that ways that users are using uh, their devices and accessing applications that really shouldn't be happening. We can help pinpoint outliers and say, you know, everything checked out, but still uh, you might want to look at this because this is not a regular behavior pattern. And uh, the other thing I should point out is that um, with our Beyond Edition, if you are marking uh, devices as um, trusted, they are also binding the user and that device together. So let's say that I got your username and password. Um, I would not only have to steal your 2FA device, whatever you're using, your phone or whatever, but I would also have to steal your laptop because it's only with that combination that I would be able to get in. I couldn't steal another trusted laptop and use it that way. It has to be that combination of user and their device and their 2FA. So um, for those reasons, we're really shrinking the, uh, the attack surface even more for the enterprise. Right. So, you know, we have a lot of organizations that, you know, people that listen that have organizations that are, you know, in this kind of hybrid setup. It's not easy for them to 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 kind of rebalance their security policies as they move along. What 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 is the process here to kind of get set up for a hybrid type setup? If they already have a hybrid environment, what is what is an organization, IT organization go through to to just kind of get them set up on this? There, there are a lot of different routes that you could take here. Um, you could start with just focusing on the users. And if you are using multi-factor authentication for all the users, then you've already incrementally improved your security. There are a lot of organizations that are only using it for remote users, for example, or they're only using it for privileged users. And, you know, the, the theory used to be that um, there would only be targeted attacks against privileged users. But the problem is if you're not checking anything internally, even a compromised regular user account can allow an attacker to move laterally or to pivot into something else and get more privileged access. So you really need to be covering everybody. Um, another step uh, would be to start looking at the devices and seeing, um, getting an inventory of what is actually accessing your applications. And this is harder than it sounds for a lot of enterprises. It's very hard to keep a running tally of, of devices, especially ones that you don't manage yourself. So having that discovery functionality uh, is also very important and it's a big win for the enterprise. 
And then finally, um, setting up that, ac- uh, that access proxy so that uh, you don't need to use something like a VPN to access applications. You can go straight through the proxy to each application, but not have access to all of them just because you have remote access. Uh, again, narrowing it down on a granular basis to an application by application basis with individual policies per application is also tightening up the security. So there are are those three ways that you can start on the road of implementing this. Right. So one of the interesting things you mentioned was like making sure that you apply policies, you know, and like, how does this help where, you know, obviously sometimes you need to refresh auth tokens or you need to refresh or re-auth for policy purposes. Um, plus, sometimes you need to enforce the kind of the hygiene of your devices because obviously things change, environment changes, network changes, uh, location changes. Um, how does Duo help here? Like, wh- how, how can it handle that type of scenarios? Um, you can set different policies, again, for different applications based on what you want to enforce. It, it's entirely possible to say, you know, you can only access this application if you're coming from this geolocation, um, but, you know, which we get from IP addresses, which, again, is it's kind of subverting the zero trust uh, model if you're starting to say somebody can access something just because they're coming from partic- a particular IP. But if you um, have geolocation requirements for security, if you have to comply with um, data protection acts in Europe, for example, you can't get around that. Uh, so there are different policies that you can do. And depending on what you think the risk is for your application, you can have them re-authenticate at every session or you know, at more often. Um, you, you don't have to continue remembering the device. Another great thing that you can do is every time that there is a new um, vulnerability discovered, for example, in an, an operating system version and a new version comes out, you can shorten the window in which your users have to update before they're locked out of that application. Usually you could say, for example, you have two weeks to update to the newest version of iOS. But if you see something being exploited that you're really worried about, you could shorten that window and you can say, usually we'd give you two weeks, but this is very serious. So you have two days to update. And if you don't, then you can't get into the application anymore. Okay, Wendy. Sadly, we're starting to run out of time. So what I'm hoping is, could I ask you to go and look into your crystal ball and do you see any trends? Do you see standard standards showing up? And in just the last couple of minutes, it's your soapbox. What do you think the industry should be doing? You know, is pertaining to your crystal ball. I'm still pretty sure I have no idea. Uh, no, actually, one of the things that a lot of people are working hard on is killing off the password once and for all. And... Um, uh, and actually, uh, you know, mentioning LastPass, I use LastPass myself and I love it. I think LastPass is one of, and other password managers are the beginning of the trend down this road of insulating the user from the password. It's, a, you know, it's a programmatic interface so that users don't have to remember um, all of those passwords that they used to have to to do. And maybe at some point in the future, we will get to the point where you only need a biometric and other invisible things uh, that the system understands about your device that will do all the authenticating for you. And you no longer have to use this organic storage, this very fallible storage for your primary credentials. Uh, so I definitely see that coming up uh, pretty soon. Uh, in the next couple of years, I think we're going to see movement along that front. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. You have done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best day enterprise tech show, according to nine out of 10 zero trusted devices. But of course, we want to thank our guests, Wendy Nather, for being uh, talking about zero trust and SSO. Thank you so much, Wendy, for being on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Can you just tell the audience at home where they can find you, your work, and a little bit about Duo? Yes, you can find us at duo.com, and you can find me at wendy at duo.com. 
And I say you've put up one of my blog posts right there. Uh, so you can read about Beyond Corp and Zero Trust in a lot of the, the blog um, entries there. And you can also reach me at Wendy Nather on Twitter. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Wendy. We also, I also have to thank my co-host in crime for today, Mr. Brian Chi, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chi Bird, can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your crazy work? I am a, <laughs> I am ADV, N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab on Twitter. I am also Chi Bert, C H E E B E R T at twit.tv. I'd love to hear from viewers. I would love to hear uh, suggestions for shows. Um, we did get a suggestion. We wanted um, – we our viewers said they wanted more on security. And we actually had a direct question. I'm sorry. I can't remember who gave it to me. That they wanted to have a, a show talking more about SSO. Um, well, maybe we'll narrow it down. We'll do another episode directly on SSO type applications. But I think we got close. What do, you, what do the viewers think? I, I hope you liked it. Anyway, drop me a line. Uh, join people like JJ to the 4884 that's been dropping me show ideas. Um, Jabba's thrown me some ideas. High Web's thrown some ideas. But you don't have to be a live viewer. You can also just throw it to me via email or over Twitter, and I'd be more than happy to try and track down some guests for you. Fantastic. Thanks, Chibir. Also, I want to thank, make sure I thank everyone that makes this show possible. Thank you to Leo and Lisa who continue to support us each and every week to do this week in enterprise tech. Also, to thank all the engineers at Twiat Twit to basically help make Twiat possible. Also, thank you to Mr. Brian G. He's our Tyus producer. Definitely hit him up on Twitter for some show options and some show ideas. He loves to get that stuff, so definitely hit him up. Also, we want to thank you you tune in each and every week we we couldn't do this show without without you we wouldn't want to do it without you you're our loyal listeners and we want to make it easy for you to tune in and listen each and every week so go right now to twit.com slash twiat find all of our episodes our back episodes all the show notes guest information information about us of course, more importantly, next to the videos there, you'll see those magic buttons to subscribe to the format of your choice, the audio, video, HD audio, video, and also the device of your choice, whether it's phone, tablet, laptop, desktop. And after you subscribe, also remember, we do this show live each and every week at 1.30 Pacific here at live.twit.tv. And if you're going to join the show live, you might as well jump in to the live chat room as well, which is IRC. That do it, that TV. So jump in there. We we have some great folks in there and they tend to give us some really great questions and sometimes they even change the direction of the show. Of course, I can't. I also want to thank my TD for today and that was Victor. Victor, thanks so much for doing the show today. Uh, can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and your stuff? Well, I'm here at Twit as always. Um, I don't really have a um, Twitter and stuff like <laughs> usual Kevin and stuff. But I, I like sharks too. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> well, of course, you can follow me and all of my interesting discussions on tech on twitter.com slash Lou MM. And plus, you can see what I do in my daily work as well as check out the jev.office.com where you can pull all the latest and greatest information about customizing and extending Office to make it work for you. Until next time, I'm Louis Mareska saying, you want to know what's going on in the enterprise? Just keep quiet. <laughs>